What is up and welcome to the second edition of the Bruin Bible. This is Will Decker for the LA Football Network. I am so lucky to have the beat reporter for the UCLA Bruins from 24-7 Sports, uh, the Bruin Report, Mike Regalado. Mike, what is going on, my man? How are you doing? Other than sweating like crazy, um, just waiting for football. Less than two weeks to Pac-12 uh, Media Day. Then football season is going to be here before before we all know it. It's going to be an awesome year, man, and an anticipated one in Westwood. We're going to be talking about the breakout players on offense and defense for UCLA Bruins. Uh, we're going to do some prop bets, some over-under kind of odds on some individual players within the roster. Uh, over-under on Pac-12 South win totals. We're just going to probably do the competitive teams from that, your USC's, your Utah's, your Arizona State's. And talking about the recruiting class and who can make an impact, before we start, Mike, uh, you host a ska radio uh, <laughs> hour. I got to hear more about this. As a ska I do. Um, I work. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have two shows actually at a, uh, a radio station in East LA. It's a low power FM station. But yeah, uh, actually tonight after this, I got to get ready because I got to uh, head over for for the show tonight. Um, yeah, it's it's primarily ska. A lot of uh, I add in uh, reggae and rock steady, some punk. Occasionally, I'll do some soul and funk, but it's 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 ska centric, yes. So, and then uh, my Sunday show called the Conversation. I basically have guests come in, and just we just rap about music, their favorite album, artists, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah, I I don't like being bored. So, <laughs> Mike, we share the common love of music. So I got to ask you, as you mm -hmm. you just pretty much labeled me right into a question. Um, <laughs> who you go into a party? It's a ska centric party with a lot of you know, fans of the, the genre. What is the album you're going to be playing uh, for all these fans? You get one album to play. Oh, might just go with the old reliable, uh, the specials. They're their, their first album. I mean, just that, that like, that just has all the bangers on it. So, uh, if I have, uh, that is a tough one or operation Ivy. Got to go a little Scott punk, a little East Ooh. Bay. <laughs> okay. And clarify this for me. Is Sublime, can you count them as ska? I do, yeah, definitely. Um, come from that OC uh, ska punk uh, bubble, that, that that family, if you will, uh, like with No Doubt. A lot of people are like, oh, is No Doubt ska? Yeah. Some of it, you know, they kind of, they did a lot of different genres, but for the most part, they started out in the scene. Absolutely. I'm a big pepper and slightly stupid guy myself. <laughs> We're going to have to hit it off a little bit when it comes to music. But that will totally. segue us into who's going to be the breakout offensive player of the year. Mm -hmm. The Bruins, a lot of great candidates, Mike. Um, if you are making the call on who may have the biggest impact on offense this year, kind of breaking out, maybe not have been a star in past years, uh, who do you have for UCLA on offense? I mean, it seems like maybe the <clears throat> the obvious choice, but uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson, just what he's done, how he has progressed. Uh, you know, I'm kind of the stat nerd um, at Bruin Report Online, and just looking at his numbers, you know, you can't uh, you know deny what he's done. Uh, just increased his uh, uh, rushing yards per attempt, his passing yards per attempt, uh, and there was a small sample size last year, but for the most part. The, you just saw a uh, a more confident, more uh, just more. I don't want to say stable. That that sounds bad, <laughs> as if he was unstable before. But he, he's just a guy who who is developing uh, into the, into the role that Chip Kelly has has set for him. So, and then seeing him yeah. in in uh, spring, uh, he just looks uh, you know a little bit more focused. Uh, you know his checkdowns. He's um, going through the motions a lot more, it seems, trying to make smarter decisions, quicker decisions. So he seems like the obvious choice. But, man, Zach Charbonnet, the transfer from Michigan, my God, he, that, that kid was just, you know, he was either running over guys, running through guys, or, you know, hitting the gaps uh, untouched. And, you know, a couple, you know, saw a couple wildcats in there. You know, I don't know how much they're going to keep that in. But, uh, the you know, he's going to be... Um, someone, someone to watch, but, at the, but also, you know, the, the unsung heroes, you know, I got to throw in the tackles, uh, Alec Anderson and Sean Ryan, those yeah. guys, 
uh, you know, upperclassmen now. This has been a young team for the first three years of uh, Chip Kelly's tenure, but it's year four. The majority of this team is not young anymore, and you got uh, an experienced line. Everyone on the line has come back. They're pretty much out close to three deep. I, yeah, I don't think we're going to see a lot of the third team offensive line, uh, maybe due to you know uh, injuries or, or whatnot. But um, yeah, those are those are three, uh, three four guys that I think are going to really make an impact this season. Mike, you nailed it. Um, you know, Dorian Thompson Robinson, I think we could see a massive jump from him this year. He was always the athlete, you know, playing quarterback, it felt like, for the first couple of years. And we always thought, boy, if he reaches his ceiling, watch out for the rest of the Pac-12 because this guy yeah. has it. Um, last year, granted, it was a smaller sample size given, you know, COVID schedule. Mm -hmm. But it was the first time in his career where he completed over 60% of his passes. Still had, you know, some of the turnover issues, little dumb throws here and there. Uh -huh. But you can see the growth. Um, Mike, I don't know if you ever played NCAA football, but that is like the stereotypical guy you would create as a player. You know, the dual threat action QB yeah. that can run and pass. And, boy, I mean, he had that long 60-yard touchdown run against Colorado. Yeah. Making plays with his legs. I mean, hitting Dulcich in stride against SC. And uh, forgot Dulcich. Dulcich. Dulcich is another one. Sorry, I didn't mean to in interrupt you, but he's woo, oh. wow. He looked good in spring. Oh my god! Yeah, averaging twenty yards a catch was Dulcich last year. And this mm -hmm. kid was a walk on. Pretty much yeah. anyone could have had him if they offered him. It makes no sense. Yeah, uh, I was seeing Ryan, the LA Football Network uh, owner and founder. He reminds me a lot of another eighty-five. He reminds me of George Kittle. For the 49ers, Ooh. the way he blocks, the way he gets downfield, he uses his speed, not afraid of contact, great hands. I mean, this guy, I mean, he to me, he looks like the best returning Pac-12 tight end. And this is in a long line of, you know, Pac-12 tight ends. Spoiler, we're going to have a prop bet on Dulcich and his numbers in mm -hmm. just a little bit. But um, call me crazy. I think this guy could be in the Mackey Award conversation when all is said and done in uh, 2021. Definitely. I mean, he's, I, I like to tell this tidbit during spring uh, when we were, um, cause where the media is, is on the like Northwest uh, Northeast corner. We have our little corner, but when they're on the South field uh, that where they did a lot of their live, uh, uh, live sets, uh, uh, 11 on 11s um, as practice was ending the last play, Dulcich caught a pass, just eked it in, uh, you know, right into the end zone and, you know, just this beautiful diving pass. And just to, you know, I just kind of, uh, uh, shout it out, <laughs> not shout it out. It was like a little under my breath. I was like, God, that was a crazy catch by Dulcich. And the, um, student, uh, student information director that was walking me back, he, he turns back to me and he goes, Oh, there's nothing crazy about what Dulcich does. That's what he does. I'm like noted. <laughs> so, but no, the fact he's a, just, he's just a big guy who's quick that's the thing that uh, is going to give UCLA a huge edge because, um, you know, right now I think their tight end unit is slightly better than their uh, receiver unit. And, and that's not a knock on the receivers. But um, one, uh, Chip Kelly, he, he's, he's going for the run. You know, he's uh, rushing yards increased uh, last season. And that, that it just seems – that is where he wants to go. We're not going to see super speed blur like we did at Oregon, but he's going to find ways to, to get yards. Um, but also the, the, uh, the receivers, they were, I, I would think they were, they were just above average, not great, but, yeah. uh, you know, Coda had a decent year, uh, Kyle Phillips, uh, you know, uh, uh, he was the best receiver and I think he'll have a better, uh, year this year. Um, and then you have Dillon Hurt, who came on late in the season. Uh, so Cam Brooks, the transfer from AM coming in. He looked good. Yeah, he looked really good. And then some of the young guys in spring, Logan Loya. Um, I'm blanking on the other freshmen right now, but there are some guys who who uh, stepped up a little bit, and that's something. Uh, aside from the fact that on the first day of spring, you know, we went in there and, and we looked around and was like, there are a lot of guys here. There was it was the deepest uh, spring. Um, that, that we had seen uh, in, uh, in Chip Kelly's era. Uh, so there are a lot of guys. It's deep. A lot of guys are pushing each other. Uh, so it's just really good to see. But there were some really uh, athletic plays that, that uh, some of the, uh, especially the younger receivers did. But 
um, you got to keep an eye on that tight end unit. It's just, you know, w- along with Dulcich, Mike Martinez, uh, Michael yeah. Ezeke, those are guys who they're big, they're, they're lean and they, you know, they can get into space. So, you know, <laughs> for opposing coaches, that's what you got to do. Not let those guys in space, but blocking has also been amazing. The fact yeah. that there is so much open space, um, you know, like, like we saw last year, you know, Chip Kelly just knows what to do. He wants all of his receivers and tight ends to, to learn how to block. Obviously, that's not going to be their primary directive. But uh, if you don't block, you're not going to play. And a lot of these guys are really in sync, especially after, you know, four years in the system. You know, like I said, this isn't a young team anymore. So the guys that were young when they came in, they're now uh, juniors and seniors. And then the, the transfer portal has just been yeah. such such uh it's treated ucla very well so um yeah it's it's it was really good to see that you know so many new guys coming in and contributing uh um uh quickly you know like i said zach charbonnet uh you guys you have uh, guys like ali Keo, um yeah alabama transfer mm-hmm. and uh the, the 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 linebacker from notre dame jordan heath Gen- genmark uh genmark heath uh so they're deep, you know, the, a lot of, that was the biggest problem. Uh, the lot, la- the first two years was the fact that they didn't have a lot of guys. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people like to say Chip Kelly ran a lot of guys off. Well, you know, there had to be a change in culture. You know, there was, there definitely needed to be a change in culture after Mora left. And that's what Chip Kelly did. Chip Kelly wants his guys. He wants heady guys. He wants focused guys. He wants, uh, athletes. Now, uh, and with recruiting picking up, you know, finally, it's uh, it seems to be coming together, and it better come together because that could be, you know, bad for uh, Chip Kelly at the end of December, <laughs> mid December, if if things don't go as they should. So, no, I completely agree. I do think there will be an uptick in recruiting. I saw that all four of our losses last year were by six points or fewer. Mm-hmm. There clearly was a jump that was made with UCLA. You know, our defense has been the, you know, long story with Azanero, the defensive coordinator there. They're finally back in the top 100. I think yeah. they finished 73rd last year. So there is a little jump to be had there. But I, before I go to the defense, I do want to talk about two other position groups that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Chardonnay. Um, my grandpa went to the University of Michigan, so I followed them religiously mm-hmm. for a long time. And Charbonnet, as you know, was a highly touted recruit from Oaks Christian High School down there. Yeah. Uh, this kid was a top 50 consensus player with 24-7 sports, rivals, scout, you name it. Gets to Ann Arbor, has double-digit touchdowns his freshman year, is kind of the leader of the running back room at that time. Mm-hmm. Falls out of favor with Josh Gaddis, the OC for Michigan, who I believe is just a guy that likes speed and space. He came from Alabama. He was more about having more speed where Charbonnet is kind of your power back. But mm-hmm. boy, what a get for UCLA to have that experience coming there to pair with Britton Brown. He was actually the first guy I thought of when I'm thinking of guys that are going to blow up next year. Like you mentioned, we have all five set, top seven returning offensive linemen from last year. Um, Sean Ryan, to me, might be a high draft pick in the NFL if he continues to play at this pace. I think he should be like a top three pick. Three round pick, I should say, uh, if he keeps progressing. Alec Anderson, like you said, is a great right tackle in the Pac-12. You know, get Charbonnet in there, and if we can see any of the signs he had from Michigan as a freshman, that's a hell of a get for the Bruins of mm-hmm. Westwood. Um, and then just some other guys I want to bring up. I think Kyle Phillips has almost become underrated. This guy has led UCLA in catches over the past two seasons. He's your typical slot guy. Uh, unfortunately, the outside receiver room, like we were talking about early, not as solidified as kind of some of the other guys. Um, so Kyle Phillips, I'm expecting big things this year. This is going to be his final year as a Bruin. Uh, he recorded 60 catches, you know, in 2019, led us again with 38 last year. Who's to say he can't get 65, 70 grabs and, you know, really kind of take off a little bit this year um, in his final season? Do you think that's crazy to say for a guy like Kyle Phillips? No, because um, he's also he's also going to be a pretty uh, sly uh, punt returner. Uh, he's yeah. he can just find the hole, 
turn on a dime and just put on the afterburners and, and, and take it to the house. Uh, so I think, uh, and especially with, um, you know, I, I think he did slightly underperform, even though he was, you know, the top receiver last year, uh, has been, you know, what the top receiver uh, the last few years. Um, I think he still has something to prove. You know, he's, he's you know, just because he's up there, you know, the, there's still room uh, to improve. And I think that, uh, you know, just, just, seeing what kind of guy he is, how he talks, how he handles himself. Uh, it seems like he's not satisfied with that and he's going to do what he can uh, to stand out this season. Totally agree. Let's move to the defensive side of the ball. Mike, you've obviously been going to spring practices, you know, spring game, you name it. Give me a player on the defensive side of the ball, which did make a jump last year. They led the Pac-12 in sacks, which I found shocking looking back on it. Give me a guy that you think, uh, is going to gain attention within the Pac-12 for being a problem for opposing offenses. You know, this is crazy because you know you bring up the sacks, and they were also, I think they were eighth in the nation in sacks per game, and crazy. I think they were 30th in tackles for a loss per game. That, that's unheard of, you know. <laughs> With me and uh, uh, my podcast partners, like we, you know, my, my, my uh, buddy Jake, he's the football guy on, uh, on, the, on the podcast. Uh, and uh, my other guy, my other uh, co-host, Bill, we're the basketball guys. And we just, you know, since Mora, we've been saying blitz, blitz them all, you know, just send everybody there. There hasn't been blitzes here. And, and last year we were satisfied. We, we, we uh, if, if the blitz, bl um, blitzes, sacks and tackles for a loss was a Thanksgiving dinner, we stuffed ourselves. We were so full after that season uh, to see not only uh, UCLA, you know, send guys in more and more, but there, and that's the thing. There wasn't just one guy. It was collective. You had Quantrez Knight at the striker position, the yeah. kind of nickelback position, uh, Caleb Johnson, uh, linebacker, uh, time, you know, there were times where he would just zip through, uh, uh, the line and, and, and uh, uh, hit someone in the backfield. Uh, the team Carl, back. Yeah. Carl Jones is another guy who he's shifty. He is quick and he's shifty and he can get around uh, bigger, uh, um, uh, I'm going to say, uh, uh, tight ends and, and tackles. Uh, it's it's just crazy what what the defense was able to do, uh, especially after bringing in uh, Brian Norwood. They, they brought him in from Navy, uh, kind of in, installed that, um, you know, d depending on who you talk to, whether it's the uh, uh, 425 or the uh, 335 <laughs> defense, either way. Um, they are, it, it, it seems like there's, uh, it's more three defensive linemen with high, two hybrids on the side. You know, it depends on the formation, but still the fact that they are using a lot more linebackers and ends and hybrid positions to, uh, disguise their looks and, uh, you know, is, it's able to help them get in the backfield is, you know, something we just ha haven't seen in, in a while. Um, and it has also helped out. Uh, their rush defense for the most part uh, defense was pretty bad in, in Mora's last season. Uh, Ooh, God, yeah. I, I don't think it was last, but I know, was it rushing defense was last? Something like that. Um, I think it was, or, or was one of the worst in the nation ever since Kelly took over. Those numbers have been going down ever since Mora's last season, rush defense numbers have gone down significantly that first year. I think uh, they decreased uh, defensive rushing yards per game by 85 yards. I think it was something like that, 81 yards. It just, and that's why I like looking at the stats, diving into it. It's like, what was that? You know, it's like, did I see that right? And they keep and, and they keep doing it. Um, so yeah. rush defense, uh, you know, not only having that uh, those guys, you know, attack the edges. Uh, creating sacks and tackles for losses, helping the uh, the rush defense, but gen just general attacking the gaps, um, you know, ho uh, holding up their blocks. It's just been quite impressive. Um, the, the, dr the drawback is passing defense has kind of gone up, plateaued a little bit. It hasn't really gone down. Not horrible, but it can be better. And I think that this year, especially with guys like uh, Quint Quentin Lake and uh, Lake. Stephen Blaylock uh, at the safety positions, um, uh, Jay Shaw, I, th I think they're going to be able to, to bring down those numbers, but that's still, that's still a waiting game. Uh, but at the same time, 
another guy, Quinton Lake. Keep an eye on him uh, in, in the uh, secondary. But uh, going back to the, uh, uh, you know, is is there one guy that stands out? I would say Quentin uh, uh, Quantrez Knight simply because yeah he's a vocal leader. You know he he might not have the best stats, but he's going to try. He's going to push other guys. He's going to bark at guys. He's going to congratulate guys. He's he's basically like uh, uh, like like the uh, um, the like general the, the dad on the team. Yeah, I mean he is a grad transfer, so uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's the guy that that brings the energy. And, you know, energy too. I know this, you know, this isn't stuff that's going to show up in the stat sheet, but the energy that the, that the defense brought in spring, it's just, it, it was good to see guys who hoop, uh, hooting and hollering, you know, big hits. They don't care who tackled first team, third team, you get a big hit. That sideline was going crazy. Uh, so I just think that there's going to be, uh, I think they also have a chip on the shoulder, especially considering the fact that, um, uh, the defense did give – I don't want to put it all on the defense, but they come back wins against uh, – or come back losses to USC and Stanford at the end of the season. Yeah. yeah um, that, was, that, was a de- that was a defensive thing. Um, um, I hate to say it, but true. Yeah, yeah. but at the same time – and that's the thing. Like you said, uh, they decreased their um, – the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the scoring margin, even in losses. Um, what was, what is that stat? They were 15 points away from being a 500 team. Uh, no, yeah. they were, they were 15 points away from being an undefeated team, not just five, uh, not just at 500, but going undefeated. That's crazy. That, that is, that's not a stat you can say about year one or two in the, in the Chip Kelly era. So even though the defensive stats are, you know, somewhere in the middle in the country, you got to look at the progress. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, the defense is, you know, it's not that great or how good can it be? You got to look at the progress from year to year, who they have, who they're returning and, you know, just what they're, 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 they're able to do. So that's, um, yeah, I can't really put one name, but uh, if I was to, you know, keep an eye on some guy, it would be, it'd be Q Knight. Quantra's Knight. I mean, this is a guy who's a journeyman has played, for Maryland, that's where he started his college uh-huh. football career. Then went to Kent State, led that team in tackles for a loss, was the MVP defensively of their bowl game win in 2019, then transfers to UCLA. Gets an extra year of eligibility, which I know Bruin fans love. This guy can make plays all over the open field. He's kind of your stereotypical safety that kind of comes into the box uh-huh. and is a little bit extra and brings a little extra pressure on either the run game or or the quarterback in that situation, which always helps. Um, the guys that I'm looking at, there's two guys that really stand out. Um, the guy I really liked last year, and I mean, Caleb Johnson, uh, I'm not he's not one of the two guys I'm mentioning, but he needs to be discussed more. When you have five and a mm-hmm. half stats in seven games, you're an absolute problem. Yeah. With his, yeah. And he did a hell of a job with that. But the, his running mate that I'm actually really excited about is Jonathan Agude. Uh, mm-hmm. Two and a half sacks. Eight and a half tackles for a loss. When you have more tackles for a loss uh-huh. than games played, you're doing something right, in my opinion. Yeah. Something yeah. right. Um, and not to mention, this was his first year of Division One football. He was a JUCO transfer uh-huh. uh, from Paul, like uh, I think in Palmdale area uh-huh. in Los Angeles, Riverside, maybe one of those two areas. But Jonathan Agude really jumped out to me on the tape, and to have him and Johnson kind of coming back blitzing uh-huh. will be awesome. The other guy I have for you, Mike, Quinton Lake. I mean, this guy, when he's healthy, he has been the leader of the secondary. He was third on the team in tackles in 2018. But the problem is, is he's only played over five games once in his career. That was 2018. Yeah. Uh, there's plays that jump out to you where you go, this guy's a pro. His dad, Carnell, famous Bruin, you know, made mm-hmm. the pro himself. Um, I was watching uh, the USC tape, for instance, last week. And Slovis is trying to get the ball to Amon Ross St. Brown. It's the first turnover of the game. I know exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) Yeah. And the anticipation he has on a guy like Amon Ross St. Brown, future NFL player, the ability to turn around midair, high point the football, bring it in. I'm like, that's an NFL play. I mean, that guy, if you can figure it out, there is a lane for him, whether it's a late-round draft pick, maybe raises his stock to a Mm mid-round draft pick, where this guy – could make the NFL. I think it's not crazy to say that this guy can be a second or third team all Pac-12 performer. What do you think about that, Mike? No, definitely. Um, 
with him, like that, that play, especially, you know, he was running on the sideline and I think he turned around and like you said, he just, he just like kind of timed it and, you know, ball hawked it out of the air. Yeah. It was like, nah, this is mine. And yeah. it's just that, that, that energy too, that, that uh, helped UCLA smack UC USC around, you know, at least early. Unfortunately, we know how it all ended, but it's just plays like that. Guys just getting out there, being more confident, you know, uh, trusting, you know, their coaches and, and their teammates. Um, there was just a little bit more cohesion, it seemed, last year. Um, and if they can, you know, just bring things together defensively, I think the offense has been pretty good uh, since uh, the second year. There were, there were flashes in the first year. Uh, second year, I thought they did a lot better. Last year, I was just like, they can score on anybody. This is, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, oh God, what was that one? There was this one stat that really impressed me. I think they were in the top 15 of, um, Oh God, I, I'll try to find that stat right now, but, uh, just what the offense can do. I, you know, I, I trust them fully. If the defense can bring up the slack, which it looks like they can't, they, they were doing in spring, you know, th this could be a very dangerous team. And I, and it's weird looking at a lot of the, um, uh, critics and pundits and the rankings and all this across the, uh, uh, you know, across the nation, a lot of people have UCLA at fourth. And I think that, you know, that, that, that seems to me that they're maybe Stupid not practice. looking as closely as they should, because there was so much progress, um, you know, last season to, to, to just put UCLA, uh, you, you know, in fourth place. Uh, you know, I, I, I think a, not a lot of people are, are paying as much as tension as they should be, because I think this team is going to surprise a lot of people this year. I think you're dead right, Mike. I think when we talked about earlier, their four losses were for a combined, like, less than six points. You know, like you said, if they scored 15 more points, they go undefeated, I think was the statement you made. Yes, yeah, 50% 50, 50 undefeated. <laughs> yeah, it, like, it, it wasn't that they were getting killed or blown out. They were in every one of those football games. If it wasn't for a late lapse, like SC – or Stanford, like you were saying, they win those games. Yeah. And, you know, I really think the country is sleeping on them. 19 of 22 starters returning. Familiarity is the big thing with Chip Kelly because I know he runs such a complex system there. But now you have all these guys that are going to be, you know, upperclassmen, senior leaders there. Dorian Thompson Robinson is a veteran quarterback at this point. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be great things. And, Mike, I am really excited to go on to this next topic. We're going to just start doing the prop bets. The first one, we're going to start with the star of the show, DTR. And these numbers, there is more of a meaning to them than you think. And I'll let you figure that out after you answer the top <laughs> bet. Okay. We got, so give me over under 3,800 yards passing and 30 touchdowns for Dorian Thompson Robinson. What's your gut telling you, man? I'd say over. I love it. I love it. With, with, with the asterisk. Stay healthy. <laughs> of course. Yeah. No one can do it without help, but I yeah, like he, our odds with that, man. We have, yeah. in my opinion, the best returning tight end. We have a hell of a slot receiver in Phillips. I think maybe this could be the year Coda kind of finally makes the jump. You know, mm -hmm. this guy was an Army All-American at one point. Yeah. But the reason I chose that passing number was he, he reminds me of a former Bruin that was in the past decade, and that was Brett Hundley, his mm -hmm. 2012 year. His best season as a passer was, ironically, his freshman year. He passed for 3,700 yards and 29 touchdowns. So if he can uh -huh. eclipse those numbers through the air, I think we're in for a good time in Westwood this yeah. fall with DTR doing it. And um, the next the next one I got for you, it's a fun other prop bet. Uh, it's kind of the tandem backs, Mike. We got Britton Brown and Charbonnet, who I believe uh -huh. to be the two lead backs. I know Charbonnet is going through his first spring there, but yeah. Mary told me pretty much confirms that from what you saw at the practices. Here's a combined total. Are they going to rush over 1,900 yards, and are they going to get 22 touchdowns between the both of them? Yes. You I'm not even thinking that? about that. Yes. <laughs> Given our offensive line returning, I do believe our run game will be top 10 within the entire nation next year. Mm -hmm. Given the line return play, given the running backs, given DTR. I mean, yeah. who could say DTR doesn't run for seven, 800 yards as well on the ground to kind of complement those guys. So I'd have to agree with you on that take. I think Charbonnet was, you know, misvalued in Michigan, and their loss is our game. 
for the Bruins. Yeah. I think he's going to be a phenomenal player. Britton Brown, according to Ryan Dyrud, who I was talking to last week, he believes he would have been drafted last year if he wanted to go into the draft. He averaged 6.7 yards a carry last year. Oh, yeah. how crazy that is. I mean, every time he touches the ball on average, you're getting damn near a first down. Call me crazy. That's a guy I want on my team. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, exactly. You got Britton Brown and Charbonnet. I'm going with the over as well. They're going to rush a combined over 1,900 yards and 22 total touchdowns. Let's go to the receiving room. This will be a fun one. Kyle Phillips, Chase Coda, kind of the two receivers that we feel most confident about. We're not including Dulcich because he's a tight end. We're going to get to him next. Mm -hmm. But Phillips and Mr. Coda, we're going for 1,800 yards and 15 touchdowns between the two of them combined. Where do you see that? I could say that that's, that's an over, you know, actually when, when you brought up the DTR thing, I thought right at the end, right before we went into a uh, running back. So I was like, wait a minute, what if Chip Kelly just really runs the hell out of the ball this year? <laughs> but if, if it's a little bit more balanced, uh, yeah, no, I mean, if, if DTR is getting that many, that many numbers, I think that, that Dakota and Phillips can combine for that too. Yeah. I agree, man. I think, you know, Coda's only had one 100 yard receiving game since coming to Westwood and this is going to be his last year there. I think we need to see that jump, given what he was recruited as. You know, this guy was a high four-star recruit. Yeah. Played in the All-American game. Phillips, I'm not really concerned with. I actually think Phillips is going to get 900 to 1,000 yards receiving this year. I think he's really going to kind of blow it open in his final year in Westwood. Mm -hmm. I'm taking me over as well. Um, nice. Greg Dulcich, following a long line of talented UCLA tight ends. We're talking Devin Asiasi. We're talking Caleb Wilson. Joe Foria, Mercedes Lewis, and that's just in the past 20 years. Yeah. 50 catches, 1,000 yards, and 10 touchdowns for Dulcet. For a guy that averaged 20 yards a catch last year and had five touchdowns. How many yards did you say? 1,000. He's just going to eclipse Oh, yeah. Thousand. Yeah. He's, yeah. Over. Over. I love it. <laughs> I love it. I think Dulcich is so instrumental uh, to, our, to the Bruins moving forward. And, you know, he's just one of those guys that you watch and – it's a, it's a term that I think Chris Berman used to use. That guy's a dude out there. Or, you know, John Gruden used to use. <laughs> that guy's a dude out there. Yeah. And I always get that when I watch Dulcich and throw on the tape because that guy's blocking. He's making pancakes. He's going out there running routes, beating defenders. I mean, the 59-yard mm -hmm. touchdown catch he had against SC. Wow. I mean, that was a play where you're just watching the game. And, you know, had UCLA's defense not blown it late. But that was the moment where I actually thought the Bruins were finally going to take down – SC, you know, that would have been a huge, huge victory for them. But, you know, I think this year, I think that uh, the odds are in our favor. So I'm, yeah. I'm really excited to watch it this year. So Dulcich, you're going over as well. I love that. Yes. Um, we're going to move to the defense. Caleb Johnson had five and a half sacks last year. Mm -hmm. uh, over under, he gets, uh, let's go eight. Oh, yeah, over. Over on the eight. I love that. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, I mean, like you said, 5.5 5, uh, 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 sacks last year in seven games. That's crazy. <laughs> it's like, um, especially for, for UCLA's defense, which hasn't really done that uh, in the in the seasons prior. So, yeah, I'll give them that. I love that. Yeah, I'm taking the over as well. We have not gotten an under yet for those keeping score. We are very optimistic about our Bruins next year. <laughs> Um, here's kind of an interesting one. It, it took me all the way back to, I believe, 2014, since the last time we had a player get over four interceptions mm -hmm. uh, in a season. Um, you know, like you said, Quentin Lake returning, Stephen Blaylock, um, Quantrez Knight. Granted, he's more of a guy who goes against the rush, but he's coming back. That's another experienced veteran in the secondary, Jay Shaw. Do you think one of those guys can get four or more interceptions in a season for 2021. I'm going to go with the over on that. Yeah. Because I mean, you, you have two guys that had two interceptions last year and that was only in seven games. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I expect the secondary to be a lot better. So, uh, which includes not, not just pressure on the edge, but, uh, guys actually, you know, downfield making plays. Um, so yeah, I think one of them will get uh, four or more, uh, uh, interceptions. I think I, I think I'm with you. It's it's very tough in college. By the way, I was looking at the UCLA history book. Raheem Moore had ten in 2009. Do you know how hard that is in an 11, 12 game sample size? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is insane. He's he's averaging yeah. almost an interception per game. 
So shout out to Raheem Moore. He was a fantastic uh, Bruin back in the late 2000s. Uh, but yeah, I think I agree with you. Quentin Lake, I think if he's healthy, I mean, we, we marveled at the play together over what he did against Keaton Slovis and USC. You know, I could see him getting, you know, four of those this next year if he's healthy and he's, you know, clicking on all cylinders. Mm-hmm. Uh, did he look healthy in spring ball? I should ask you that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there were some guys who were, who were dinged up, uh, but it, you know, it's spring, you know, if a guy is, you know, on the sideline, you know, don't take, don't take too much, uh, uh, put too much into that. Uh, especially, you know, Chip Kelly, we asked him about, uh, all the guys that were sidelined and he goes, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, precautionary. If it was game day, 90% of the guys that were sidelined would be suited up and playing. So, yeah. um, yeah, yeah, I think he was out for a few practices like towards the end there were there were a lot of guys that were out not necessarily injured but um yeah it's just you know just being precautionary uh i yeah still he looked good sweet i love to hear that uh we're gonna get some quinn lake hopefully get our fingers crossed we can get him for a 12 game slate this next year yeah um and uh yeah that's all i got for the individual statistic prop bets we're going over on all of them. We're very confident in our Bruins this year. I love it, Mike. Um, let's move to the Pac-12 South. I'm going to talk about the top three contenders kind of against us. Uh, mm-hmm. That would be Arizona State, Jaden Daniels, Herm Edwards doing big things up there. Um, Utah, Kyle Whittingham always puts together a competitive squad. And the Crosstown rivals, the USC Trojans, mm-hmm. Slovis, and Drake London coming back. So those are going to be fun. Um Let's talk about Arizona State. I think their over-under has them at nine, which is it's a little dicey for a lot of people. Um, where do you see uh, ASU going next year, and do you think they can get nine or more wins? I, you know, I think they're good. I just don't think they're as good as people think, and especially if there's fallout for you know with what happened. Uh, was it you know a few weeks ago with the recruiting violations? Yeah. Um, that I think is going to affect them. So I, you know, I, I just can't see nine wins for ASU. Um, but either way, you know, you, you name those four teams, UCLA, USC, Utah, and Arizona state. I think they're just going to beat up in each other. So I think for any team, it's going to be hard to get uh, nine wins. Yeah. I think it's really going to remind us of, you know, some of those big 12 years where the offenses are just, it's like 50 to like 45 games. <laughs> you know what I mean? It feels like no defense is being played. I feel yeah. like that's how it's going to be because, you know, three of these quarterbacks, if they play their cards right, you know, whether it's Daniels, whether it's Slovis, whether it's DTR for that matter, mm-hmm. if they all have big years, we could see these guys all playing on Sundays. Like that is a, yeah. I think a very feasible option. And the offenses are going to be very high powered for all of these teams. So I think it's going to be like, you're, like you were saying, they're going to be beating up on one another uh, coming this year. Um, let's move to Utah. Whittingham always overproduces. I think they were listed at eight wins flat out in Salt Lake City. Uh, do you think they overachieve or do you think they go slightly under? Um, I think they overachieve. I th- You see, that one's tough because of the quarterback situation. Um, you know, is that all that going on? Yeah. Yeah. Are they, you know, is, uh, are they going to have a set quarterback? And is that quarterback going to be able to uh, run the def- uh, run the offense from from game number one? Um, you know, it's a, that's that's the one thing that uh, that's uh, holding me back from saying that they're going to be you know flat out um, uh, the winners of the of the South Division. Um, I think that they will be the South Division winners, um, but I got to see how that quarterback situation is. But at Fair the same enough. time, I mean, everywhere else, they're pretty much stacked. You know, they also have uh, Theo Howard, former Oklahoma Sooner and UCLA Bruin, uh, uh, you know, uh, on their side now. So they have a weapon at receiver. So, um, but yeah, Whittingham always has his teams prepared. Um, so it's going, it, it's hard to say that they will get nine wins. Like I said, I think everyone's going to beat them up, but I think they're going to be the closest to achieve that. Yeah, I don't disagree. Theo Howard's kind of their version of Quantrest Knight at this point on his third team, making an impact. Um, we'll root for Theo from afar, but not against our Bruins come this year. Uh, <laughs> Do some uh, stuff against USC and uh, Arizona State. <laughs> yeah, 
Take it to SD, man. We would love that. We would love that all day. Uh, yeah, help us out with ASU too. Uh, Theo, that would be awesome. Um, let's get to SC, Crosstown Rivals. I think they're listed at nine wins as well. Slovis, uh, probably the odds on favorite if you were gambling uh, for the Pac 12, you know, Offensive Player of the Year. Drake London looked sensational at times. I think they've got Elijah Griffin coming back in the secondary. Uh, highly touted safety they have there. Um, Kind of give me your thoughts on the Trojans, and do you think they can get more than nine wins? I don't, and that is because of a one Mr. Helton. <laughs> Helton just um, – he's not a horrible coach, but he's not a great coach. And for – you know, I might, might be speaking blasphemy here, but in order for USC to be the USC that everybody n- n- hopes they will be, you know, Helton has, has to – up his stock or they need to get a, a um, coach that is going to take them to the promised land again. And, you know, everyone thought uh, they were going to get um, oh, I'm blanking on the coach. He's now Jacksonville's coach, uh, former oh, Ohio Urban State. Meyer. Urban Meyer. Urban thank Meyer. you. That was the whole talk. And Bruin fans were just like, Oh great. If they get Urban Meyer, it doesn't matter if Chip Kelly you know, improves. We're screwed. Uh, but then um, UCLA's savior, uh, uh, um, the athl- um, now I'm blanking on the athletic director, USC, decides to uh, keep Helton. <laughs> and, and it's like, cool. We, USC fans were like, uh, UCLA fans were like, we agree with that. We're Yes, good. Thank you. That says something when your rivals are cheering, uh, retaining a coach that, their fan base doesn't want. It says quite a bit. Um, but, y- you know, USC did pull out what, what I think was it, the first two, three games. They were, they were losing within the last minute and found ways to win. Um, yeah. And whether that is uh, having coaching uh, elite players or, or a combination of both, you know, they got, the, they got the job done. Now, they didn't get the job done in the Pac-12 uh, championship game. Um but yeah, there just seems to be like hiccups that Helton just can't get past. And with um, with this Royal Rumble in the South Division, I, I don't think he's going to get to nine wins. That's just me. I agree. I think it's going to be harder for Slovis. I doubt he puts up the numbers people are thinking because his offensive line is just ravaged. They lost three yeah. or four starters, if I'm correct, from last year, um, including some high-profile players. Uh, going in the NFL draft. So I agree with you. I think they're going to be an 8-4 and four team. They're going to be the classic. You know, remember Matt Barkley's senior year there? Everyone thought they were going to be awesome. They went like 8-4. and four. I think that's kind of what I'm going to see a repeat of with Slovis this year. I think that's very feasible for those teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike, I know you're a busy man. I really appreciate you having you on. Uh, before I get you to go, give me one impact true freshman for the Bruins next year. Um, Devin Kirkwood. Oh. Um, secondary, he just exploded on different plays. He's just quick, confident. He, he was hitting guys. And at, just because, uh, like I said, there weren't really guys injured, just sidelined towards the end. Uh, because of that, you know, he popped into the, uh, uh, played with the first team uh, a few practices. And, you know, some people could say like, oh, that's just because they're, they're down to, you know, the, whatever. But no, this, this kid can ball out. So yeah, he's, he's one that, that I have my uh, eye on. Yeah. Kirkwood six foot four, I think uh, secondary corner. I mean, you can't make that stuff up. Yeah. We'll be able to guard any receiver out there on the slot and on the outside. Uh, Mike, thanks again so much for coming on. Um, I'm going to be heading down to hopefully a couple Bruins games this year. I'd love to get a beer with you in person, maybe talk about our Bruins and, uh, Yeah, I hope you have an awesome rest of your night, man, and look forward to speaking with you soon. Yeah, let's do it. Same. Thank you very much.